Hello, everyone. No matter what time zone you're joining us from, good day and a very warm welcome to this Bayer LinkedIn Live event on AI in healthcare with particular focus on medical imaging. I'm Melinda Crane, and it's my pleasure to accompany you today as moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you hardly need me to remind you that we are on the cusp of a new era in healthcare. And amongst the exciting disruptive technologies that are transforming diagnostics and treatment, artificial intelligence stands out for its potential to improve the accuracy and also efficiency of medical imaging. Increasingly sophisticated algorithms are promising to become ever more adept at recognizing small anomalies on scans that might otherwise go undetected, while also supporting radiologists in handling their ever-growing daily workload. Clearly, that has major benefits for radiologists and for healthcare providers, but what about patients? Will it improve their experience and their outcomes? How could AI make a difference for patients? That's our title today, and we have an outstanding lineup of speakers to answer that question. I'll introduce them in just a moment, but let me first say beforehand that although we're meeting virtually, we want to make our discussion as lively and as interactive as possible. So dear ladies and gentlemen, you can share your questions and your brief comments using the chat function on this live stream. After each of our speakers shares his or her perspective, I will pass your questions on to our panelists. And this event also is being recorded. So if you miss anything, no worries. You can access our discussion afterward on LinkedIn and also on YouTube. And we will post the link on our LinkedIn event page. So now let's get started. Let me begin by asking our panelists to share your respective perspectives on the potential of artificial intelligence in medical imaging. From your particular vantage point, where do you see the biggest future gains? And it's a pleasure to hand over to Bayer Radiology's Senior Director of Medical and Clinical Affairs Digital Lead, Dr. Ankur Sharma. The floor is yours, Ankur, please. Hi, Melinda. And Thanks, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, before getting into AI and healthcare specifically, I'd just like to talk about healthcare a little bit. Um, healthcare is a complex system that patients kind of experience and interact with um, a multitude of healthcare professionals. All these people kind of have the same end goal, and the end goal is to achieve successful treatment for the patients. However, in order to achieve success in treatment, you kind of have to make sure that you have the right diagnosis. This sounds like common sense and an easy thing to do, but the act of achieving the correct diagnosis can be quite complicated. There are a multitude of inputs that feed into diagnosing a patient, ranging from different specialists, lab tests, to imaging. So imaging is, is one of the fastest growing diagnosis tools. Imaging includes things like X-ray, CT, MRI, and all of these different imaging modalities play an important part in a variety of different healthcare stages, such as screening, detection, monitoring, and, and even in treatment. So with all these different touch points within the healthcare chain and its high value as a tool, it's really no surprise that the demand for medical imaging is growing at an incredibly high rate. This increased need of imaging is fueled by several factors as well, uh, including large aging populations and, and changing lifestyles that um, increase, lead to increases in chronic conditions such as cancers or cardiovascular diseases. As a result of all these factors, medical imaging data itself is becoming more complex than ever. And when we compare this number of, of or volume of data to the number of available qualified and trained radiologists, you can see how difficult it is to tackle these challenges in healthcare and specifically in medical imaging. So we, we need to look forward and develop technologies that can aid us. And 
you say, okay, what does that mean? Well, we, we need to sensibly take advantage of opportunities which combine our human expertise with artificial intelligence. Radiologists are already asking for disruptive technologies and solutions that improve the efficiency of their workflows within radiology departments. Um, currently, however, AI is, is a little scattered. The, the algorithms and, and solutions are, are being used in an adjacent manner to the existing workflows and not necessarily integrated to gain efficiencies. This means that radiologists switch between systems, platforms, and applications in order to complete their review of a study. This back and forth eats into what is already a critical and limited amount of time that radiologists have. This is where we need to be innovative. Bayer as a life sciences company has a long history in diagnostics and therapeutics and innovating in each. Our approach has always been holistic as it should be and based on a deep medical understanding across uh, a multitude of disease states and built on close ties with clinical specialists. Our ambition is to build on this expertise to drive digital innovation that assists, assists uh, excuse me, assists healthcare professionals in making informed decisions uh, at critical steps within the patient's healthcare journey, um, ultimately to improve outcomes and workflow solutions for hospitals, clinicians, and most importantly, for the patient. Thank you very much, Ankur. Very interesting indeed. And uh, I, we want to drill deeper a little bit later on on uh, some of those challenges uh, that you talked about. But let me stay now uh, with uh, the potential that all of you see of AI in connection with medical imaging. And we will go next to a leading patient advocate who is working to advance diagnostics for a cancer that's often detected relatively late. Could AI help? change that. That's what we hear next from Dr. Amy Moore. She's Vice President of Global Engagement and Patient Partnerships at the Longevity Foundation. Welcome. Thank you, Melinda. As you said, you know, lung cancer is a challenge because unfortunately, despite it being the top cancer killer, it's often not diagnosed until late stages when outcomes are worse. So clearly the opportunity for AI is to stage shift and, and increase and improve early detection of disease when outcomes are um, more favorable. So clearly we want to deploy that. I think you know one of the things I would add to on Kerr's comments is obviously there's been an intersection of lung cancer and the pandemic. And so what that means in terms of cancer screenings in general is we have seen patients falling off from those critical screenings where we can catch the disease. So one, how can we use AI to ensure return to screening, but then also how can we ensure that AI can be deployed to catch cancer earlier? And we're not thinking just about LDCT or low-dose CT screening, and that's in certain populations, but we know that lung cancer is growing also in younger individuals. One of the challenges of lung cancer is that it still remains highly stigmatized. There's an association with smoking, but we know that it's increasingly detected in younger patients who have you know, no smoking history at all or who quit smoking years ago. So how can we also use you know, AI technologies in the context not only of screening, but incidental nodules and how to manage those? Additionally, in the context of the pandemic, how can we use AI to uh, analyze those changes that may be occurring in the lung and differentiate maybe COVID or SARS-CoV-2 induced alterations, distinguish those from pathologies like cancer? So I'd be curious to have a conversation around that. But certainly at Longevity, as you said, we're a patient advocate foundation. So part of this is also we'll get into later how can we educate and empower patients about the opportunities and potential for AI, make sure we're doing it through a health equity lens, and make sure we're getting these advances to the patients and meeting them where they are. So looking forward to Very the good. discussion. And yeah, again, uh, the challenges in connection with that would be something of great interest uh, a little bit later on. Let's uh, now hear what AI advances mean for radiologists uh, themselves. And Ankur mentioned that increasing workload that radiologists uh, are facing and also the scattered uh, sources 
of information that they that they're dealing with. Now, I recently came across the following quote from a practitioner, so I just want to put that out there. Uh, it's this, in 20 years, people will be in disbelief when we tell them that part of our job description was to count pulmonary nodules. Now, at the same time, there is lively debate about whether this disruptive technology will replace or empower those working in the field. So let me ask Elliot Siegel whether radiologists need AI, and if so, why, when, and where, and Dr. Siegel is professor and vice chair at the University of Maryland School of Medicine's Department of Diagnostic Radiology. The floor is yours. Thanks, Melinda. And so I think there's, in short, the answer is we do need AI. We do need smarter um, information systems. And uh, I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for us to take advantage of those advances in technology, including AI. Um, Encore did a really nice job of uh, introducing the topic of medical imaging. And, you know, I just want to underscore the fact that medical imaging is a crucial part of providing accurate and timely diagnosis and in guiding treatment decisions. Uh, imaging has revolutionized the practice of medicine. Uh, we've talked about lung cancer diagnosis, and we have the capability now to be able to diagnose uh, lung nodules or really early lung cancer. Um, as small as uh, two millimeters on uh, CT and to be able to do incredible levels of um, staging of cancer and also follow-up of treatment of cancer using PET scanning and a variety of other imaging modalities. And we've been focusing on um, lung imaging, but of course, um, Im uh, imaging is utilized for interventional procedures. It's used for um, emergency diagnoses. It's used extensively in oncology beyond um, lung cancer in, in so many different areas. We talked a little bit about um, screening studies and we're doing screening for lung nodules, although in the US, we're probably screening less than, I would say, five to 6% of the eligible population who could be screened because of all of the onerous things that are manual steps that are required right now for a radiologist to uh, interpret the studies. And I think that there's tremendous potential to uh, increase that number. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is that imaging is continuing to expand as time goes on as far as indications. And people are doing um, using MRI and other modalities in ways that we have not before. Um, also, as far as uh, new indications, um, we're looking at um, the implications potentially of liquid biopsies as we see patients come in with a suspicious um, result from a liquid biopsy suggesting that they have an increased likelihood of having cancer, but not exactly sure where the cancer is, imaging is gonna have a whole new role in trying to sort that out. Robotic guided surgeries with uh, imaging and um, you know, all sorts of different types of uh, screening for population health are expanding fairly rapidly. Um, what do I feel like as, as a radiologist here in 2021? Well. Me and my colleagues are increasingly feeling like sort of Lucy and Ethel at the candy factory. And for those of you who are too young to remember uh, uh, Lucy, I, I would recommend going out to see the uh, new movie that's out, actually. But uh, that episode at the candy factory with the assembly line moving faster and faster and Lucy and Ethel not being able to cope as humans with that speed, but needing some sort of assistance is just hilarious. But it also underscores the challenge between keeping up with the increase in complexity and volume and also trying to maintain a high level of accuracy and efficiency. And so there's been a tremendous amount of burnout among colleagues of mine, in addition, you know, of course, to non-radiologists, but um, this area of volume and complexity has been an increasing challenge. And so, yes, we do need help from advanced information systems, including AI. And particularly the pandemic, of course, has created um, new stresses for radiologists and the number of images and imaging studies and complexity is at an all time high. Um, I had the world's first PAC system that I'd set up in Baltimore in 1993. And when we set that up, we wanted to have any image, anytime, anywhere. But the other reason we wanted to go from film to digital was the whole idea of being able to have the computer be able to help out in diagnosis, these AI applications. If you'd asked me um, 28 years ago, if I thought it would take this long to be able to have 
computers more routinely do image interpretation, I would have been shocked. I would have thought it would have happened sooner. But now the technologies are converging to put us at a point where I think we're going to accelerate fairly rapidly with implementation. Um, and so I think the challenge that we have at this point is we have so many hundreds or even thousands of algorithms that are out there and there's a mismatch between what's available from a theoretical perspective to what I actually have implemented in my practice. And the thing that I really need is to figure out how to be able to take these algorithms that are incredibly promising and incorporate them into my routine workflow. And I think that's the biggest challenge that we have in 21 and why it's taken so long to be able to uh, implement these into practice. So very much looking forward to uh, the discussion, thanks. Yeah, we want to drill deeper on that challenge, ch challenge. Let me just ask you very briefly, because I did mention the fact that there is debate about whether this is a technology that will wind up replacing humans. What do you say to that? Yeah, so I, I think that one of the favorite quotes I've heard is that it's not so much a matter of AI replacing radiologists, but AI, essentially radiologists that are using AI replacing radiologists that don't use AI. And essentially what we're seeing is it's really very much a collaboration. For me, when I work with radiology fellows and radiology residents, my trainees, you know, they learn progressively during the year and they end up helping me out in so many different ways. Um, and I really, you know, I don't think those trainees will replace me, but they surely make me more efficient. They sure keep me on my toes. The problem with those trainees is at the end of the academic year in June, they leave me and now I have a new fresh group of residents and fellows to start training. And what I'd love to do would be to have something that persists, continues to stay with me and learns as time goes on. So I have no um, doubt whatsoever that radiologists will continue to flourish. They won't be, we won't be replaced by AI, but many of the more mundane, repetitive jobs um, that we have will essentially allow us to devote our time to the cognitive skills that we have rather than the repetitive things that we are doing. So it will make us safer and more efficient, but in no way will yeah. replace us. Thank you very much. So sure. let us now drill a little bit deeper on where artificial intelligence is already making a difference in radiology. And Steve Worrell is CEO of Riverain Technologies, which has brought forward machine learning and advanced modeling software that already supports hard pressed clinicians who are screening for lung disease. Steve, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, I very much echo uh, some of the things that some of the other speakers have said. And um, <clears throat> I think, you know, five years ago, roughly, you know, there was sort of the message was that uh, radiologists wouldn't be necessary anymore as AI sort of made its mark uh, in, in healthcare. And I think that's been clearly dispelled. And I think, you know, more than anything else where AI can have a positive impact, both for the radiologist as well as the patient, is taking some of those tasks, as Elliot indicated, that are quite uh, arduous, right? And very time consuming, very subject to error and automating uh, many of those functions. For example, uh, measuring the properties of, of a, a potential lung cancer as a nodule, right? So machines have unbelievable capacity to do that with high precision and do it in three dimensions versus two dimensions. And so this is something that I think, you know, as a um, organization that develops these algorithms and then commercializes these algorithms and puts these algorithms in clinical use, um, that's certainly something that we look for is opportunities to uh, provide value in context of those things that uh, are subject are, are suitable for automation and are quite time consuming and arduous for uh, the radiologist. So, so that so that certainly is one thing. I think the other thing is that um, uh, imaging exams are, are typically done for a very specific reason. And uh, there's tremendous information in those exams outside the original purpose of that exam. And so an example of that would be incidental nodules, right? So a, so a patient uh, is in an accident, uh, uh, there's some trauma, therefore they are imaged with CT. And so the objective of the exam was not at all to detect nodules, but 
the reality is it's an it's an opportunity to detect z disease earlier right um sort of uh as an incidental finding and <clears throat> and then that patient can then uh have the benefits of earlier detection which has uh improved outcomes based on that earlier detection uh, so i think that's a tremendous opportunity uh for for ai to bring value and to look at exams for reasons outside the intended purpose of that exam um, and i really think that ai can really will touch every aspect ultimately of the patient's journey whether that be detection diagnosis management or treatment right so um in all cases, you're dealing with very rich data, which which is very complex, which is very difficult to sort of you know ascertain what the what this may be telling you. And this is something that machines are particularly good at is vigilance and and really being able to analyze things in uh, great detail, not subject to uh, oversight, not subject to distraction, not subject to fatigue. Right, so just the ability to always be on, always be uh, looking for indications of disease and find that disease as early as possible so that then we can better uh, improve patient outcomes. So I think, uh, I, think, I think we're really very early on in this journey. And I think, you know, there is um, some uh, successes that uh, are being realized today in, in the healthcare environments, and I think, that will build confidence both on the uh, provider side as well as on the patient side. And then I think this will just, you know, as that confidence builds and uh, organizations continue to innovate and find opportunities to improve efficiencies and improve outcomes, uh, I think it'll, it will just naturally uh, evolve in terms of what aspects of the patient journey does uh, AI solutions, uh, you know, have an impact. Steve, can I ask you uh, from uh, your own vantage point, would you agree with what we heard from Elliot in regard to whether this technology will empower or replace? Uh, because we do have another question that's come in from an audience member, Ashke Joshi, who says, will AI replace clinical assessment, especially for end point? Um, so what do you think? Is this technology so fabulous that it's essentially going to render uh, our human judgment obsolete? No, I, I, I think what Elliot indicated is exactly uh, correct from the standpoint that, you know, um, very uh, abstract contextual decision making uh, is very challenging for machines to do, right? And that is what humans are incredibly good at. They're very good at um, you know, sort of uh, taking uh, unclear information and, 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 and making a decision based on context that may be unrelated to the image data itself. Uh, for example, patient history, things of this sort. Um, so I think there will always be the need to have the human in the loop, right, for these more abstract, more uh, final decision making uh, tasks. Uh, I think where the machine can really help is freeing the radiologist from doing many of those more mundane, time-consuming tasks, so they have time to really think about things uh, on a different time scale than they may have the luxury of doing today. Because as Elliot said, you're kind of on this assembly line, right? More patients, more volume of data, uh, more pressure to get through uh, a higher number of exams in a given period of time. So you know, if we can if we can free their time up, right? So they can spend more time thinking sort of uh, holistically, contextually about what this may be indicating, then I think that's where AI really provides value. Thank you very much. Let me ask uh, any of you to perhaps uh, speak to the following question. I won't ask everybody to do so because otherwise we're not gonna get to the challenges, but Jérôme Aubert is asking, are there any concrete stories where patients were literally saved by AI technology? Anybody want to tell us such a story? Uh, I mean, I, I can share, I mean, we, so we, um, we've deployed our solutions for chest CT uh, quite broadly across both academic medical centers and veteran uh, administration hospitals. 
as well as radiology groups. So we we routinely uh, hear from users about uh, uh, nodules that have been detected and then found to be cancerous that would not have been detected otherwise. So that's very satisfying, right? Personally and as a as a as an organization, but I think you know um, you can imagine you know. Given the given the uh, criticality of detecting cancer earlier, particularly lung cancer, um, that you know those situations where a, a lung nodule was detected that hadn't been detected wouldn't have been detected otherwise has a profound uh, impact on on that patient outcome. So we don't necessarily know at you know what patient, but we know uh, that you know the product is providing value from the standpoint that it's leading to detections that wouldn't have occurred otherwise. Thank you. Um, yeah. I have another uh, question coming in that's that's related. Uh, Marcus Brandel uh, uh, asks us, um, actually, I guess it's coming, sorry, it's coming from Pankaj K. And the question is, if we're looking at the use of AI in imaging applications, how soon do you think we can detect cancer as compared to traditional human assessment? So essentially, again, asking, how much does this speed things up? Ankur, I see you nodding. Do you want to speak to that? I think it varies on a, a couple of different factors. Um, you know, when you're comparing, this is kind of like the old John Henry, right? The the man versus train uh, tall tale, I guess. I, I, uh, it, it really depends on on the AI and how it's been trained, what it's been, you know, designed to detect. And as these algorithms get better, they're only going to be able to detect more. Um, but again, we're not talking about an AI competing with the radiologist, right? We we're not saying that the the AI is better at a than a radiologist. Uh, and therefore the radiologist is obsolete. We we want the radiologist to be empowered to use this tool for early detection, right? We we know that sometimes there's structures that are in a scan like vessels and uh, you know different organs that may occlude or make it harder to identify uh, some of these structures and cancers or lesions. And having that algorithm that's trained and as those they learn and develop kind of to what Elliot was saying with his you know, uh, analogy related to his his residents, as they learn and get better, it's a stronger tool for the radiologist to identify these things earlier in, in combination and collaboration. And if I may just add to please. that oh, quickly, um, there was a study that was just reported in the press this week coming out of France that showed that you know, it may, you may be able to move that timeline up by as much as a year um, for detecting lung cancer. So the potential is there. And I think when we talk about innovation and improving outcomes, that's, you know, what we're looking to do is to say how how quickly, how far in advance can we push that timeline? Because, you know, every week, month, year matters when it comes to improving outcomes. So I think that's the potential, but, you know, there are caveats. And as we've heard from our colleagues, it, it matters, one, you know, how um, reliable the technology itself is, but then how you've incorporated that into the larger health ecosystem and how you've deployed it. And so there are still challenges there as well. And one really I important have, point. Yeah, please, Elliot. I'm sorry, I wanted to come to you. <laughs> is the fact that we are now able to detect lung nodules far sooner than they actually become actionable. And so in general, um, recommendations for follow-ups don't even occur until lung nodules get to be perhaps five millimeters or, or more, depending on who you talk with. And we can now find them in um, patients you know, where there are two millimeter nodules. In fact, um, as we, are more able to see more detail. Um, we're able to pick up lung nodules in, in many cases in two thirds of the entire patient population. And so really the challenge I think is utilizing AI to figure out you know, what are the characteristics of the ones that we're picking up that are most likely to predict which ones will turn out to be malignant. One other key feature is the fact that we're screening now only about maybe five or six or seven percent of all the people in the U.S. who actually could be screened. It's not so much what we can see on a scan as the fact that we have patients who are walking around with tumor masses and large nodules and, and, and malignancy 
who just aren't coming in for screening. And so I think AI will uh, increase our ability to be able to efficiently screen those patients and will increase the numbers of patients who actually come in for screening in the first place. Plus, AI also can look at patient information. The a priori probability of disease is really important. So, for example, according to the PLCO um, data of 155,000 patients that were followed for many years, a Pacific Islander patient in the U uh, has a six-fold greater chance of developing lung cancer than a um, Latino patient. And if you look at family history of cancer, if you look at all the different risk factors, figuring out how to intelligently screen and use AI and machine learning models to predict who should be screened, how often they should be screened, I think is really critically important to early detection of disease in addition to better and better imaging technologies that can find the disease earlier. Let us now talk a little bit about those challenges that some of you have touched upon, but perhaps let's take a, a deeper dive now, essentially uh, to ask what needs to happen for this potential you've all described to be realized. So I'm just going to go straight across the panel and ask all of you to speak to the obstacles and challenges that you see as of uppermost importance when it comes to broader uptake of AI in imaging and and perhaps also just a word on who or what can address those challenges and drive this forward. So I'll start with Ankur. Yeah, I think as um, kind of, you know, Steve, Elliot, we, we've all alluded to is that um, one of the bigger challenges is that all these digital technologies are, are creating vast amounts of image data uh, that is valuable to patient insights and it augments the role of the radiologist to be closer to diagnosis. Um, but to how to handle all this massive amounts of data is, is really a big challenge. And so one of the ways that AI can help in this is that it can help you know, identify acute cases and then therefore aid in triage, reducing time to treatment, kind of what we were talking about. Um, it also can support, you know, kind of reducing those non-interpretive tasks that are time consuming, aid in, in some of the early intervention and screening, um, kind of as we've already been discussing, and then uh, kind of help with the diagnostic confidence in a reading so that radiologists can then therefore focus on the, the cases and parts of the diagnosis process that require their full expertise and, and depth of knowledge and kind of the interpretation of all those variables uh, that, you know, they're the experts at and, and not AI. So screening, triage, repetitive tasks, uh, these are all kinds of the things that are the strengths of AI, as Steve was mentioning earlier. So what we need to do with these challenges is leverage those strengths and implement them in a intelligent and functional way that really strengthens radiologists for radiology uh, and give them access to the better tools that complement their skill set that um, would be beneficial to their patient case needs. So this is why Bayer is, is working on a digital platform for medical imaging, which will provide access to a curated selection of applications, which healthcare professionals can utilize directly within their imaging workflow according to their clinical needs. Using our clinical expertise and scientific expertise, we're partnering with a wide range of clinically relevant AI providers and developing our own solutions to drive innovation further to find these solutions that can support radiologists. And this is the way we can best accept and, and resolve some of these challenges. And Ankur, I have a, a, an audience question uh, essentially addressing uh, the, the, the latter point that you made. It's from Pankaj Rajdio, and he asks, what startup opportunities do you see for medical imaging and the whole ecosystem? Where do you see niches that could be very uh, productive for entrepreneurs? Well, I think there are a wide range of opportunities, right? Uh, it, it varies based on kind of what approach you want to take. What is the problem that you want to solve? And there are so many different disease states out there that require imaging as a tool, as we've been discussing. And any of these disease states all could potentially benefit in some way from an, an AI solution or an algorithm. So the first step, I think, would be to identify kind of what disease state uh, you want to want to target. The second 
thing that might be beneficial is kind of understanding where in the workflow of a patient journey and a physician journey that you want to be able to make an impact or a touch point. And kind of where these two things cross is where I would start with trying to identify a potential for, for uh, innovation um, as a startup. Mm -hmm. And Steve, do you also want to speak to that uh, point as well as to challenges and obstacles uh, from your perspective? Yeah, sure. The um, yeah, I I think you know um, uh, as Inc. was saying, it, it, there's almost unlimited number of opportunities or possibilities, right? And so I think um, you know uh, from a you know opportunistic startup perspective, I think. Um, you know, identifying, understanding medicine and understanding maybe radiology more specifically, understanding sort of what what the obstacles are and challenges are for the radiologist. And then, you know, so really define the problem and, and, and define the problem that you want to solve and define the need, right? And so I think, um, I, I think there's always opportunity for a better mousetrap even, right? So even though there might be competition, uh, I think there is, um, you know, uh, performance trumps uh, most things, right? So I think you might consider uh, uh, exploring public data sets, for example. So you identify a use case that's interesting to you and that you think uh, you can bring value to and then uh, find an associated uh, uh, public data set that you can then begin experimenting with and understanding the complexity of the problem. And, and begin developing a solution. And um, so I think, you know, one, it's a uh, very rewarding uh, space to work in. Two, it's uh, very critical from a, a societal standpoint, right? As aging population, more opportunities to, pro to improve patient outcomes. Um, but uh, it will be a, it'll be a, a fairly long journey, right? From the standpoint that, you know, healthcare is very complex, it's regulated. Uh, it can be challenging to commercialize, but I think uh, the rewards are well worth it, right? From from the from uh, from you know what you end up providing from a value proposition standpoint. So um, you know, define your problem carefully, and then identify uh, collaborators and identify data sets, right? That you can truly understand the complexities of the problem. Thank you very much. And speaking of complexities, let me go to Amy and ask you, I've got a couple of audience questions I want to put to you, but first of all, let me ask you to talk about your perspective on key obstacles and challenges, especially when it comes to patient engagement and patient acceptance of this technology. Right. Sure. And I would like to kind of refer back to some prior comments as I address this. I mean, I think, you know, at longevity, Certainly in the lung cancer space, early detection is key. And, you know, both from a screening perspective as well as managing those incidental nodules and how to appropriately do that. But we're focused on the entire care continuum. So how can we leverage AI not only for early detection, but also when it comes to we're very focused on precision medicine, comprehensive biomarker testing, lung cancer has really been a proving ground for deployment of precision medicine. So there's opportunities to leverage AI for treatment matching for clinical trial matching. Another work stream that we're focused on is modernization of clinical trials. And so there's an opportunity to think about AI in clinical trial design. That's beyond the scope maybe of our discussion today, but then we also get out to survivorship for patients. And so there are AI um, technologies out there focused on mental health for cancer survivors. So truly AI can span the entire care continuum, as Steve mentioned earlier. I think, you know, another um, challenge that we want to focus on is we were talking about removing humans from the equation. You're never going to remove patients from the equation. And so we very much want to think about how do we educate and empower patients around the opportunities for AI for shared decision making. Because at the end of the day, whatever AI uncovers, we're going to have a dialogue with the patient about what they want, what their what their goals are for treatment and outcomes. And so longevity focuses on improving outcomes, but also improving how people live with cancer. Mm -hmm. So that's critical. You know, you're never going to get rid of the patient, the human that's part of this scenario. And then a couple of challenges and concerns I have is again, 
we're grappling with disparities. And so when we think about AI technologies, we want to make sure they get to those populations where the burden of cancer and, and poor outcomes is a reality. Oftentimes in working with one um, lung cancer investigator who's in Tennessee and has a catchment area that touches on highly disparate populations, poor rural, how do we get these methodologies, which can be prohibitively expensive in our community hospitals? How do we train people to use them so that patients don't have to travel to large academic medical centers? That's key. Um, so I think, you know, again, back to the data sets, um, I formerly had worked with a crowdsourcing challenge for a, kind of a startup um, team that was looking at a methodology to detect lung cancer nodules earlier and, and to think about how to manage those. And really the rate limiting step for them was getting access to those large data sets. And what we find is that sometimes people can be a bit protective of those data sets. Maybe that's changing, but this was only a couple of years ago. So again, educating and empowering patients. I see. Let, let me pause yeah. there. Let, let, let me um, pick up on your remarks about data sets because I have a couple of questions that go to that point. Uh, the first one is from Harish Parovada, and he asks, how do we source and curate data ethically for AI development? Also, what measures do you take to avoid bias in medical AI? And um, I have another one. I'll just Put this one in there too and then speak to perhaps both if you can. This is a comment from Natasha Peshnik saying it's fabulous that machines can recognize patterns and alert radiologists, but can these big data be processed in a legally compliant way to secure patient data? So security and also bias. Uh, perhaps Amy, you want to speak to that and then others who also wish to speak to it, I'll, I'll let you weigh, I'll, I'll ask you to weigh in in just a moment. Well, I think certainly from the patient perspective, those considerations are top of mind. You know, what you find is that many patients with cancer are very eager to share their data, but they want to know that it's done ethically, that it's done securely. And so, you know, in terms of the regulations and how to do that, I'm sure my colleagues have much more experience and can speak to that um, more articulately. But from a patient perspective, I think, yes, there's a willingness, but they want to know that it's done appropriately and securely. And I'll Thank defer you very to my much. colleagues for yeah. the rest. Well, one more, one more quick one to you, because you also mentioned clinical trials, so I'll just put this one out there as well. Akshay Joshi uh, asks, when will regulatory agencies allow usage of AI in clinical trials? I mean, certainly I don't have a definite answer to that, but what I can tell you is that at least at longevity in the lung cancer space, we're working with key stakeholders such as the FDA and others. And part of my role as global engagement and patient partnerships is trying to understand the regulatory landscape in Europe, looking at the HTAs and other groups to um, understand what are the considerations around clinical trial endpoints. Uh, we also have a scientific and clinical roundtable where we convene um, discussions with key thought leaders around some of these topics. So clinical trials, endpoints, and, and things like this are something that we are aggressively discussing and um, trying to understand more clearly. Um, and I think, you know, especially in light of the pandemic, I think there is an opening to invite more discussion of how can we more fully integrate technologies like AI um, to kind of round out the ecosystem and add value to patients. But I can't say that I know when when that will occur. And by the way, that was an issue that we uh, dealt with in a recent uh, LinkedIn talk that is in fact available on uh, the Bayer LinkedIn website for those who are interested on patient engagement and use of uh, digital technologies to try to decentralize and widen that, especially in the pandemic. Let me ask others who would like to comment on the data sets to do so. Who would like to do that? Elliot, you're nodding your head. Sure. Would you like to speak to that? Yeah, I'm really happy to do that. So um, I had actually um, about 15 years ago created something called the National Cancer Image Archive dataset, which was an effort to have the National Cancer Institute uh, create and curate large data sets. And with those large data sets, um, we had the capability of being able to collect huge numbers of CT scans of the thorax, for example, as were one of the data sets. And that um, encouraged uh, a tremendous amount of algorithm 
development. And that's why so many of the AI algorithms we're talking about are actually um, algorithms for, uh, for lung cancer. Um, the problem was is that curating those data sets, including the National Lung Screening Trial, was a quarter of a billion dollars to set up the 29,000 CT scans that were um, there. And what I had thought 15 years ago would be as time went on, it would be easier and easier for hospitals to essentially um, be willing to share their data um, for large data sets. What's actually happened is we've moved in the opposite direction, that all of the um, folks who were doing ransomware attacks on hospitals and all of the challenges have actually resulted in increased lockdowns of data. And so what we're seeing now are efforts that essentially use something called federated learning, where the idea is that you can keep your data at your facility, you can train AI models at your facility, and then you can keep the coefficients of what you've learned, and then we can take multiple hospitals that have kept the data locally, done the training, and then essentially combine the knowledge from those models and coefficients into something that would allow one to be able to develop an AI model that is relatively diverse from multiple centers without the data actually leaving those facilities. So that's one of a number of different um, promising ways that we might be able to uh, collect and, uh, and curate data that, that I'm excited about. But you know, when we talk about the challenges for AI, one of the biggest challenges I have as a radiologist is I have a difficult time sometimes knowing when I'm looking at an algorithm, say from Riverain, for example, what Steve was talking about, where the data was trained. Was it trained on my population? I work uh, at the University of Maryland. Is my population in Baltimore the same as somebody's population in Phoenix or in China or in Europe? Um, I also train at the department. I also work at the Department of Veterans Affairs, and that patient population has a very different um, you know, relative bias as far as likelihood of cancer and exposures. And so will an algorithm that was developed on a different po population than mine work on my population, which is why it's so critical to know the provenance of the data, to minimize bias, to have the data be as generalized as possible, but then to be able to try and have um, patients like mine essentially identified and where they can train a subset of their algorithm on patients like mine also, what I want for my AI algorithm is for it to learn as time goes on. We we're talking about my residents and fellows. Yeah. Well, my population at the VA or the University of Maryland may be different than other populations. And so as I get experience with an AI program, I want it to learn my population and have feedback iteratively as time goes on in a manner similar to the way humans learn. I'd like to get Steve to also weigh in on these points uh, and especially on whether uh, whether data security or the lockdown, as Elliot referred to it, whether that's posing problems for your company as it tries to develop this technology. And then also what you're doing to ensure the security of this data that you obviously so badly you know, need masses of in order to, to, in fact, allow your algorithms to learn. Yeah, so um, certainly data acquisition is, uh, you know, one of the many ongoing challenges, so to speak, with respect to developing AI solutions. And um, in part because of that, uh, we've invested quite heavily in, in what we call synthetic data generation. And this is having, this is having more and more um, traction, if you will, not only in healthcare, but also in other verticals, such as autonomous driving. And so essentially what we've invested in is the ability to take a relatively small set of data and then synthesize three-dimensional disease and insert that three-dimensional disease into an otherwise normal patient or a patient with comorbidities. Um, and so there's a lot of advantages of that. One is one of the big challenges with that go beyond just acquiring data is the need for very precise what's referred to as ground truth or you know knowledge of where the disease is, what its characteristics are, and things of this sort. And so when you're when you create synthetic disease and then you insert that synthetic disease uh, into an otherwise normal patient, you have precision right with respect to known characteristics known location etc and so that's one of the ways we've sort of you know uh addressed 
you know, not only the, you know, the challenges with respect to getting data, but also uh, challenges with respect to the precision and uh, ground truth associated with that data, because you need very precise labels uh, in order to build these type solutions. And Steve, um, thank you very much. Synthetic data sets. One other point is that um, it's possible to take uh, data from, say, in my case, at the University of Maryland, where we may have millions of cases, and then to create based on an AI system using a generative adversarial network system, there's the potential to be able to create new images. So yeah. the AI, the system learns what just abnormal images look like, generate new ones the same way that we can generate synthetic faces from large databases of people's faces. And so then I can generate millions of synthetic images that are inspired by the actual pathology. And then I can actually take the synthetic data, which um, is not in any way patient identifiable, and then share that in a larger database. And so the other strategy, in addition to federated learning, is to use my data to create synthetic cases and then share those cases. And now we can have a database of the synthetic cases from many different institutions and use that to train AI data sets, as, uh, AI algorithms as well. Thank you very much. Let me go to Ankur. You've been nodding. Uh... Uh, at a number of, uh, of of the points that have been made by the other panelists. Maybe you want to weigh in on some of those as well, but I also have a couple of additional questions for you. I'll just put out one of them now and then speak to perhaps that and uh, and some of the other points we've been we've been talking about. Uh, this comes uh, again from Harish Parvavada, and uh, he's asking or saying AI can be a great addition for performing large-scale analytics on EMRs to understand patterns in disease progression and care uh, that's received. Interoperability of healthcare data is a major blocker for such analysis. What's your point of view on moving past the interoperability concerns? And you also talked about fragmentation in your opening remarks. So maybe pick up on that again. And he, he finishes by asking, is Bayer doing anything interesting in this area? Yeah, so uh, I'll start with the previous uh, conversation, and I think you know Steve and and Elliot really kind of uh, talked very well about the data sets, and I think it's also very important. While we talked about mostly generating this data uh, in an artificial sense or in a representative sense, um, in in general, though, what we need to do is make sure that any of those data sets is diverse. You know, Elliot's point about, hey, is it representative of my my area in, 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 you know, Maryland? And can it learn that? Well, yeah, that's very important. But, you know, when we create these algorithms, they need to also already be prepared for a diverse population. Because while uh, Elliot's population in Maryland is, is you know, generally... Uh, static. It it is diverse though because you do have a mix of cultural and ethnic backgrounds and um, just population diversity that is to a different extent smaller than you would maybe in, if you were in San Francisco or in the Midwest or in Europe or in China. But we we still need to make sure that that diversity is built into these algorithms from the beginning, um, so that they're just as effective in subregions and then can learn based on that to be better in the subregions. Um, in terms of kind of how can we uh, get this kind of, let's call it a collaboration in the healthcare system and workflow, this is a hurdle that I think will be better resolved as we have better algorithms developed. As they show their value and the clinicians are able to better use their data, and we have them in a secure manner working in our infrastructures and healthcare systems, we'll be able to start leveraging data from different data sets, whether it's you know the 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 AMR or where it's pathology, and and kind of then combine these things. But currently, just because of kind of the some of the cybersecurity issues, the data sharing issues that we've already touched on a little bit, as well as just kind of the space that we're in in kind of the early stages of AI overall in healthcare. Uh, it's just not where we are, but it's definitely a, a positive direction to go in. I have another question uh, as well. 
that uh, picks up a, a little bit upon on 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 where we're going and uh, what kind of demand that's going to be generating. And uh, it's Pankaj uh, K asking. To what degree AI in imaging can improve treatment plans on a large scale, especially if we take the patient history or specific genetic risk markers? And then, uh, and this is this is the one that I was referring to. How do you see the improvements in medical systems and infrastructure going forward? What will we need, Ankur? Yeah. So, right. Uh, I think we talked about this as well. Earlier detection. Um, you know, finding a long lung nodule before you can act on it uh, means that now you have this delta that now treatment has to catch up. We can identify this at, you know, two millimeters, but currently we can't act on it until it's five millimeters. Well, maybe treatment needs to catch up as well. Uh, identifying these deltas using algorithms is going to improve the overall patient journey. And as we add more data sets to this and add that interpretive nature that, you know, Steve and Elliot talked about where the radiologist and the clinician is going to take these different inputs to kind of uh, make that determination and leap into what is the appropriate treatment, what is the appropriate schedule, and how do we monitor this through through imaging? That's that's all going to be coming together as the future state. That's really the, the goal here, right? We want to be able to put all these things together so that we have the better treatment um, plan for the patients. So in terms of the infrastructure, you know, as we develop more of these things, cybersecurity, the the cloud-based, you know, algorithms, all these things are are starting to move in the direction that, yeah, hospitals and industry and, and AI developers all have to increase their awareness uh, around all these factors, right? So we we have to be better at cybersecurity and how can we do that? Can we implement a cybersecurity feature that allows us to, um, you know, use multiple AI applications in a secure and safe environment? That's that's something that we need to consider and, and look at developing because that security is what's gonna protect our ability to uh, innovate and expand the indications for usage of algorithms as well as more importantly, protect the patient data, which patients care about, physicians care about, healthcare systems care about, and, and the industry all cares about. I have, uh, I still have many audience questions coming in. I just want to uh, say that we have had nearly 4,000 people with us, or over, over 4,000 people with us for most of this discussion. So no wonder we're getting a lot of great questions. Don't have a lot of time left, left but let me see if I can fit in a few more. Here's one from Ramya Chandrasekharan, who says it's been a great discussion and uh, actually picks up on, uh, on a little bit on what Ankur was just saying, asking, are there regulations specific for AI involved products? Who would like to speak to that? Steve, maybe? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> yeah, there is uh, FDA regulatory guidance uh, related to AI applications or software in general. And so uh, it's it's quite clear and depending on the nature of the device that you're building, is it a triage device? Is it a detection device or is it a diagnostic device? Um, there's different levels of uh, regulation related to each of those. But uh, you can find those things if you do um, uh, a search in Google, for example, FDA uh, regulatory software guidance, you'll be able to see some of the, you know, some of the criteria related to uh, getting approval in the United States. Thank you very much. And let me try to fit in one from Matt Miller, who's asking, how do you imagine the next phase of a platform of how insights from each individual AI application in a suite could connect to a larger opportunity for patient community health trends and findings. I want to pass that one on to Amy because uh, because of the connection with patient and essentially public health issues. Sure. I mean, as I said, I think, you know, from our organization's perspective, we're very much focused on that continuum. So, you know, how can we, one, detect disease earlier, but then what are the next touch points? So how can we flag a nodule that looks suspicious or once that diagnosis occurs to make sure that they in the context of lung cancer, automatically get put through for a comprehensive biomarker testing. We want to know, do they have an actionable biomarker for which we could then match them to 
you know, precision medicine. We have a growing list of approved targets and uh, targeted therapies, immunotherapy that are extending, improving, and saving the lives of patients with lung cancer. Beyond that, you know, are there clinical trials? So how do each of these um, AI um, uses, how can we connect them to make sure that it's kind of a fluid experience to optimize outcomes for patients, that they don't get lost at any point in the conversation? Because, you know, even when it comes to biomarker testing, we know that less than half of patients here in the U.S. are getting, you know, multi-gene panels and even fewer are getting next-generation sequencing. That, you know, in this age is is really, you know, almost unforgivable. You know, all patients should be getting this testing, getting access to these precision therapies. So, you know, I do think that the future is bright, but, you know, I think we still have a ways to go in operationalizing AI in the context of healthcare and then educating patients about its potential and, and making sure that those, you know, two sides are, are really talking. Um, so... We're just about out of time, but I do just want to give Elliot and Ankur a, a chance to say one last uh, closing sentence, literally one, if you don't mind. Um, obviously, we've mentioned it several times, AI is a relatively young technology, uh, high expectations, as you've all outlined. Um, what is the key thing needed to drive this innovation forward? Uh, Elliot? Well, so um, I think the key is to remember that radiology is not an island and that it's absolutely critical that when we're talking about AI, we're talking about an enhanced electronic medical record that's currently, I think, in the Flintstone era, where what we need to do is to be able to have um, information flow into radiology and AI systems from all of these other systems to optimize um, the ability to be able to make predictions and to help make judgments. And I think all of the results of radiology need to then feed back out of the island of radiology, essentially, out to the rest of the system. And so as we have these discussions, we need to plan how radiology fits in with the larger ecosystem. Okay. Ankur, please, your last, your your parting thought. Yeah, I think Elliot is right, but I'd like to expand a little bit. You know, Elliot talked about the collaborative nature between the AI and the radiologists and the healthcare systems. We really, if AI is going to be successful and we're going to be successful in implementing it to its full potential, we really need to collaborate broader than that. We need to collaborate between not only the systems, but healthcare providers, the systems, research institutions, and industry. And, and when we all work together to identify the problems, we can then work together to create solutions that then best fit the needs of those clinicians who use these tools. And then that impacts our ability to uh, better help patients. And that's the end result here that we need, right? So uh, without collaboration, we're never going to get to the full successful potential of AI. Thank you very, very much. Closing words there, speaking directly to our title. Um, and uh, and what's in this for patients. And I think that certainly uh, is what we have heard over the past hour. So many, many thanks to our panel participants for this very uh, wide ranging and very uh, lively exchange. Thank you as well to all of you who have been with us throughout uh, this, this fascinating discussion and for your excellent contributions, dear audience, as well as for your time and attention. And as I mentioned earlier, if you missed anything, you just want to see the discussion again, you can find a recording on YouTube and we'll post the link on our LinkedIn event page. Many thanks to Bayer for making this panel possible. And, uh, and thanks again to our speakers. I wish everyone a good afternoon or a good evening. Stay healthy, have happy holidays, and hope our paths will cross again in future. Goodbye. <laughs>